Good morning. Welcome to the live in person and live zoom worship service of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside. Our opening hymn this morning is number 121, We'll Build a Land from the Gray Hymnal. Please feel free to sing along as the spirit moves you, but only with a mask on. Please stand and body your spirit and joining us in singing hymn number 121, We'll Build a Land. Thank you for joining us here, and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom, where we will continue to live stream and post these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I'm Alec Peck, the chair of the worship committee, and I will be your worship associate for today. Other members of the worship committee, uh, oh well, you'll also hear from me, as you just heard, singing our hymns. Uh, <clears throat> we welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart and with muted electronic devices, please. 
We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together make us each, each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. While we are here, please keep your masks on and socially distance. We can speak in normal tones, but singing or chanting creates an increased risk of airborne exposure, so we ask you to refrain for the time being. We invite those of you in the sanctuary to sit back and enjoy listening, and for those of you at home, sing your hearts out. And now I invite you to sit back and take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the covenant of our church. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to live in service to humankind and all life in fellowship, thus we do covenant. Our speaker today is a UUCR member, Dr. Lee Greer. Lee is an evolutionary scientist, author, and educator. Linda and Lee have been members of the U Church of Riverside for a number of years and have three lovely children. Free thought, reason, and free inquiry have deep roots before the Enlightenment. The forebears of Unitarianism and Universalism have contributed to a rich dissenting stream going back to the Ionian Greek philosophers before Socrates with further tributaries <clears throat> from the East. Today, the narrow confines of the cultural and political left and the right are increasingly threatened by this heritage. We must defend and advance it. We have two lightings of sacred flame. The first is the occupied indigenous people's remembrance candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, a symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign people, the original people of this land, who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples including the Cahuilla, the Cupeño, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with the space and opportunity and to strive to live out our common principles to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Today's chalice lighting is from Reflections on the Constitution <clears throat> and Belief and Unbelief by Philip Morin Frenet. I think, some French name, sorry. Uh, Thou, nature's self art, nature's God, through all ex expansion spread abroad, existing in the eternal scheme, vast, undivided, and supreme. In evidence, belief is found. Without it, none are fairly bound.
we have a tradition here at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. <clears throat> we know it can be uncomfortable to speak up in front of others. And so I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic that we have up here at the front and speak into it directly and clearly so that everybody can hear. Is there anybody who can uh, volunteer to introduce themselves? If not, I can. Well, as I've already said, my name is Alec um, and I've been here for a couple of years. And uh, I've been here for a couple of years, um, uh, but <clears throat> I came so I can't aim to Riverside in the middle of the pandemic. So it doesn't feel like it's been nearly that long, uh, but I've been a UU since I was uh, quite, a, uh, quite a young child. And so, uh, but when I came of age, it was my choice to uh, what religion to stay with. And I really love the principles and what they stand for. And I love being a UU, so that's why I'm here. If we have any visitors, old friends, uh, or anybody else new uh, who'd like to introduce themselves, uh, please raise your hand and I can call you up to our microphone. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you so much for being here. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to meet you in the previous weeks. I, like many others, have been on summer vacation, including going to UU summer camp. Um, and so I still have hope that there uh, that there's a, a few more people than than it at first appears uh, who 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 are invested in in our message here. Thank you. Uh, is there also anybody else online? You can raise your hand on Zoom, and we will call on you in that way. Um, or anybody else here who would like to introduce themselves? Right now, it's not looking like it. Well, <clears throat> for any... Yes, definitely quite a few online. Um, and for any other new guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after our service. We'd love to have a chat with you and get to know you <clears throat> outside the parish hall and where you'll also find our visitor's book, uh, where you can leave your name if you'd like before you go, uh, so that we know that you were here. And if you'd like also your contact information, if you'd like to know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to be added to our mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. <clears throat> and now I've got a few quick announcements that I'd like to share. During our service, we'll mention some websites, email addresses, and phone numbers like the one I just did. And then at the end of the service, we'll have a slide with all that information, and it's also available all on our website. The sharing of joys and concerns is one of the most important rituals of our community 
and an opportunity to share the milestones, losses, achievements, and experiences with one another. Now that our doors are open again, on the first Sunday of each month, we can both hear from those in the sanctuary and read from the contributions that we've received over the month. In the front of the pulpit, there's a book where you can write your joys and concerns while you are here in the sanctuary. And for those of you at home, you can send your joys and concerns throughout the month to you, Church of Riverside at gmail.com. Our next joys and concerns will be on August 7th. Please also join us for the Roy Zimmerman concert on Thursday, August 11th, which is at 7.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Roy's concerts are a lot of fun and they're centered around current political topics with a suggested donation for each ticket of $25 going to the church. The Social and Environmental Justice Committee will be meeting today at, in the annex at 12 noon. At 11, the Social and Environmental Justice Committee meeting is today in the annex at 11 a.m. You can find the Zoom link and more information on the website under Social and Environmental Justice. And Adam, can we know the general topic for today? CAT 901 and also an open discussion for you to uh, bring your own ideas. Um, <clears throat> okay. Ah, yes. And now this portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church, which can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here, and you may also contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is on the church website, also in our newsletter. <clears throat> Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater's grocery cards, which we'll have in the church each Sunday. You'll get the full value of the card, and the church also receives a percentage for free on top. And Amazon cards with a similar deal are also available. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give your time and your talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Will our ushers now please receive the collection? And our next hymn is number 402, From You I Receive, also from the Gray Hymnal. Please feel free to sing along as the spirit moves you, but please only with a mask on. Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 402, From You I Receive.
And now I would like to introduce Dr. Lee Greer speaking to us on our UU heritage, the radical enlightenment, and the dilemma of today. Lee? Thank you, Alec. I will quickly switch out here. Can I, yeah, good, there we are. Great, all right, so now let's put it on the slideshow and then we'll be ready. Cave, well, this is a, this is a very interesting topic that we have today and, it, and it's, a, it's a time of hope to think, think about, even though we have had, uh, looks like civilization sometimes is collapsing. It's collapsed several times before, actually, and it manages to come back. I want to start with a meditation right now first. In UU fashion. And it's going to start with some pictures which were just released this this past week, the star forming region of NGC uh, 3324, which is from the new James Webb Space Telescope. Stars, this actually right here, this particular image is from the Hubble telescope, but you can see when you add a little bit more infrared emphasis in there, how it looks different with, with the James Webb. And then Stefan's quintet in infrared, okay. group of galaxies with um, Differing red shifts, by the way, but all still together interacting. Interesting stuff going on there. Okay, and uh, and also one one of the Abel cl clusters, uh, SMAC zero seven two three, both with uh, with the Hubble and with the James Webb. And of course, as you saw the, the, the media hype this, this past week, this is the first time we've ever seen the 13.1 billion light years. Well, that's a, actually not true because it hasn't surpassed the Hubble ultra deep field, which uh, there is 13.1 billion light years on that galaxy centered right there. And the average group in this word, these redshifts were published uh, in 2015, R Rafelsky et al. From, from the UV through, through the infrared part of the spectrum, the average galactic distance is 10.6 giga light years with, or billion light years distant. There's one at closer 5.7, young stellar age there. Here's one at 8.3 billion light, light years, old stellar age, reddish in the hertzsprung russell di diagram, old stellar age, the, the light was old when it left 8.3 billion years ago. Here's another one at 10, point, 10 billion years ago. Again, groups of, of stars indicating great stellar ages that were old 10 billion years ago. Here's, here's another one, also 10 billion light years. Ago. And I've been showing you mostly stuff that is less than the average in this picture. Okay. And this is old stellar populations, old 10 billion years ago, showing that we're still fighting a deal, dealing with a, with a Ptolemaic system that has a universe too young in the theory, because the actual universe is not that this young. And if, here's a star in our own galaxy. So I, I would like to read this meditation from Francois-Marie Arouet, more commonly known as Voltaire. He was a French deist. He was a moderate deist, philosopher, reformer, novelist, and so forth. He, he said, tonight I was in a meditative mood. I was absorbed in the contemplation of nature. I admired the immensity, the movements, the harmony of these infinite globes. I admired still more the intelligence which directs these vast forces. 
I said to myself, one must be, not, must be blind not to be dazzled by this spectacle. One must be stupid not to recognize the author of it. One must be mad not to worship him. What tribute of worship should I render him? Remember, the Vol Voltaire was one of the great iconoclasts who, of course, re rejected Christ Christianity and all of that. He said this, uh, what should I render him? Should, should it be a tribute in the same, should not the tribute be the same in the whole of space since it is the same supreme power which reigns equally in all space? Should a thinking being who dwells in a star in the Milky Way offer him the, the same homage as the thinking being on this little globe where we are? Light is uniform for the star Sirius. And for us, moral philosophy must be uniform, he said. If a sentient thinking animal in Sirius, or it means around Sirius, he is born of a tender father and mother who have occupied, been occupied with his happiness. He owes them as much love and care as we owe to our parents. If someone in the Milky Way sees a needy cripple, if he help him, and if he does not do so, he is guilty in the sight of all globes. Everywhere the heart has, has the same duties. On the steps of the throne of God, if he has a throne, and in the depths of the abyss, if he is an abyss. That statement right there is an allusion to the controversies which were going on at his time over the whole issue of the nature of reality. And that's what happens in every period of enlightening that takes place in human history is there's deep questioning of assumptions. All right, we're going to examine it, of course, from, from the moral foundation, the evolutionary moral foundation, which we always work from, reciprocal altruism, which goes beyond the golden rule, to the diamond rule. Treat others as they, would, as they would like to be treated, not just as you would like to be treated, which is the golden rule. So this is the diamond rule. It's rooted, of course, in our evolutionary past. Simple algorithm, cooperate on the first move and reciprocate on every other move thereafter. And it is found in our seven principles, principle number seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part a web of reciprocity which stretches back for our planet about 4.4 billion years on our planet. Now let's look at a curious phrase which appeared in the Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776 of, of these United States. There were only 13 of them at, at the time where the author, and of course there were many signers there, but the author was one named Thomas Jefferson the same Jefferson who took scissors to the, to the Bible and cut out everything that he felt was, as he put it, dung and kept the moral teachings of Jesus that he thought could be traced to him. It was a time of questioning, as I said. All right? The laws of nature and of nature's God. What, did he re what was he referring to when he said nature's God? Now, in our modern day of historical revisionism and uh, recurring barbarism, nature's God is supposed to be, is supposed to be the Judeo-Christian deity. It is in fact not that, as, as we shall see. And of course, our Bill of Rights, the idea of universal rights, freedom of speech, press assembly, all of those rights which are there and uh, which were, uh, which were forecast in various movements of the Enlightenment on the continent before uh, flow from this particular view, this particular understanding, including our First Amendment. In the election of 1800, uh, Thomas Jefferson um, was facing, he was running for the first time, and he was hated by, by, the, by the clergy who wished to establish religion in these United States. But he said this, he said, and there was all kinds of conflict in that election. Some people have even called it the Revolution of 1800. It, was, it, it, it ranks up with the American Revolution. He said, the returning good sense of our country threatens abortion to there. That is, that, that is the clergy's hopes. And they believe that any portion of power confided in me will be exerted in opposition to their schemes. And they believe rightly, for I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. But that is all they have to fear from me and enough to, in their opinion. 
And this is the cause of their print, printing lying pamphlets, you know, memes, what we would call today or, you know, fake news and whatnot. Okay, those words underlined there are what is in the Jefferson Memorial. The context of them is not there. The context is him standing up against the religious, the, the Judeo-Christian elites of the country in favor of religious freedom. And of course, the revolution in France, also with the same principles, of course, our own Thomas Paine defended the revolution against Edmund Burke, uh, the declaration of the rights of man and the social state, uh, and so forth. Well, let's go back for Unitarians way back. Let's jump back to the end of the last time a world was coming to an end, civilization was in decline from its near its peak in the Augustan age in the Roman Empire, which was a time of actually a lot of cosmopolitanism, all right? Christianity was on the rise. Christendom was on the rise, not quite yet. This is 138. This is at the time of the end of the Bar Kokhba rebellion in the time of Hadrian. This was the greatest extent of the Roman Empire, okay? And Christianity had many warring sects among them. Matter of fact, these, this was the areas that Christianity had traveled by, the, by 300, but almost all of them were heretics of some sort, okay? Many of them were, were heretics, and there was, there was an elite, this is by 500, okay? There was an elite group who had, who had already taken Jesus and turned him into God and done a bunch of councils and all of that, but there were other earlier versions of Christ Christianity which were more tolerant, which had spread quite a ways be before they were ultimately crushed. And in the collapse of the civilization, of course, that happened with the rise of Christendom is what, is what uh, has been correctly called, even though it's not politically correct, the Dark Ages, okay? And, and that, the light didn't really lift there until the Renaissance which means the rebirth, because what are you being reborn from, right? Something that was obviously problematic. In the centuries after that, a whole network of work of heretics may be found spread out across Christendom. And it is that group of heretics where Unitarian Universalists come from within that group of heretics. Okay, so now we zoom forward in the lead up to the Enlightenment. Of course, we had many Arian and Unitarian Christ Christians who were champions and some who were heretics who refused submission to the established Judeo-Christianities, -Christ and there were different versions, of course, Latin Christianity in the, in the West and Eastern Orthodoxy in the East. They pioneered the way for the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, toward freedom of religion and expression, and even democracy. Now, Stepping back from that oversweep, it's important to know that there are three major enlightenments in the Western world. The first one is the Ionian Greek enlightenment between the sixth and the third century before the common era. Then there's the, then there's the Islamic enlightenment in the 10th through, through, through the 12th centuries at the time when Europe was in the throes of, of, its, uh, of Christendom, you know, um, Augustine's fabled city of God, which was a disaster for, for Europe. And then the European Enlightenment, 1650 to 1800. This is called, sometimes called the long 18th century. It's basically a 150 year period there. What characterized each of these in, in, intervals? Of course, they were deeply conflicted times, but there were aspirations by small minorities of a secular cosmopolitan tolerance and a universal ethics, not just an ethics which extends only to your own tribe. A flowering of learning, growth in understanding of nature and natural causation or natural philosophy or science. And the deepest thinkers viewed nature as a causal whole, what is called philosophical monism. And there were aspirations of liberation, freedom, knowledge, questioning of societal norms and beliefs, and evening, even seeking a basis for human rights and democracy. You have some of those little tidbits even going back into the Ionian Enlightenment. 
Immanuel Kant, one of the moderate Enlightenment char characters, very famous because you won't know the name of, of the radicals as much, even though the radicals are far more important for our time. But he was one of the moderates. In an article in 1784, toward the end of the 18th century, Was ist Aufklärung? What is enlightenment? He said, enlightenment is man's release from self-incurred immature dependence. Immature dependence is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. Self-incurred, of course, when it causes, when its cause lies not in lack of reason, but in lack of resolution and courage to use it with, without direction from another. Sapere aude, dare to know, have courage to use your own reason. This is the motto of enlightenment. Everywhere, this is the 18th century, he says, everywhere there is restriction on freedom. If, if we are asked, do we live in an enlightened age? The answer is no. But do we do live in an age of enlightenment, a process that is ongoing? The same truth is true today for always a minority, a small group that sees clearly. Well, the enlightenment, of course, is not one, historians have often mistaken as one movement. It was a big conflict with with the radicals, the Epicureans, Spinozas, the radical deists on one side, the Newtonian, Lockean empiricists, even though Locke himself was one of the biggest secrets of, of the Enlightenment. Locke, who is almost universally admired, was secretly a, an Epicurean, was a radical. That has been shown. Now, he just dis, dis, disguised his language well. The Leibnizian Wolfian movement, and then of course in the counter enlightenment part, so that's the moderate in, enlightenment, is the Cartesian Mal Malebranchist uh, consensus. Though they were moderately anti clerical and they were for enlightened monarchy. And then of course you had the, then you had the full blown counter enlightenment, which, is, which was clerical, traditional, crown and the cross, all of that. And they all had their own views of God. The radical enlightenment itself was a clandestine network of dissenters, Unitarians, Sassinians, free thinkers, esprit faux, strong spirits, that means, and radical Republicans advocating freedom of expression, democracy, and free love among the bustling docks and bookshop sh shops of Amsterdam in the Dutch Republic of the Golden Age before the second Orangist restoration of monarchy in 1672. That web of clandestine manuscripts and purveyors of radical ideas, mostly from Holland, went to France, to England, and throughout Europe and to the Americas during the latter half of the 17th century and leading into the ferment of the enlightenment of the 18th century. Now, if we look at the sources for our American revolutionaries, the radical ones, which are in that pale blue or whatever that color is, teal, yes, thank you, all right? And here, this tree is from Matthew Stewart in his work um, on the subject. You have Ethan Allen, Thomas Young, Thomas Paine, Benjamin Franklin, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, Washington, Fanu, who, is, who a poem was read from, Madison and Adams. They were influenced largely by the pink philosophers, which included Bolingbroke, Shaftesbury, both Deus Locke, Toland, Collins, Toland, Locke, and Collins were, and Shaftesbury and Bolingbroke were actually radicals, all right? But often you can include H Hutchinson and others, and then some f influence from the French too. Pierre Bale, uh, Voltaire, Baron Dolbach, Diderot, so forth, but less influence because of language barrier. And then before that, you have Spinoza and Hobbes, okay? influenced by Descartes, Vanini, Gassendo, and Giordano Bruno, very enigmatic character, linked through a Roman poet named Lucretius back to Epicurus. Okay. Now, this montage which I've put together for you tries to uh, capture the, the essence. It's uh, topically rather than chronologically organized, although there's a slight nod in the, in the in the chronological direction. There you will see Sir Isaac Newton and, and Gottfried Leibniz, both the co-discoverers of calculus, I guess I just revealed 
where I stand on mathematics. I'm kind of a platonic on mathematics, just co-discoverers of the calculus there. You can see the new view of the, of the Copernican sun-centered universe, René Descartes, who brought together geometry and you know, one of the founders of, of analytics and one of the systematizers of, of philosophy in the early half of the 17th century influenced, of course, many of the later thinkers. And, and the separation of life into its components by Newton's prism, of course. All of this is symbolic within this framework for the next part of this. That light goes back, goes over uh, René Descartes' head to an unusual figure who is a composite figure, someone holding a lamp on a small uh, speck of a moat peer, peering out into the, into the abyss. Okay, that symbolizes, that symbolizes Bruno and, and Lucretius and, and of course, uh, others like, uh, like Epicurus himself and Democritus, the atomists, who first glimpsed the infinity of reality. Of course, right central there is the radical enlightenment, Pierre Bale and, and Benedict Spinoza, uh, both of those, uh, one, one of uh, thrown out of the synagogue and, and the other a Huguenot heretic, but both actually Epicureans underneath because they, they, they rejected the tribalisms they were raised with. And then in the next part, that radical core influenced via Locke, okay? And Diderot, okay? And of course you see the, the, the Promethean uh, act, symbolic act of uh, Benjamin Franklin's kite bringing electricity, bringing the lightning down. Okay, that is the, of course, Prometheus was the one who defied the gods, right? Okay, and in Greek mythology. Okay, and brings us down to the high enlightenment, of course, Voltaire, Denis Diderot, the, the, encyclopedia, the encyclopedias, the rights of man, the declaration of the rights of man. Of course, Thomas Paine, who, uh, who was one of the central radicals of the American Revolution and we, and we the people of the US Constitution. It was mediated through the Arab Islamic Enlightenment who preserved some of the Greek knowledge and their most leading thinkers were also monists, also saw, saw the unity of all things. And they preserved some of the Hell Hellenistic cosmopolitanism that goes back to the, time, to the Alexandrian period. By Alexandrian, I mean Alexander the Great and his attempt. Sometimes empires by accident do something that's good, right? So, okay, all right. And of course, to a manuscript which appeared, one copy left, one copy survived of Titus Lucretius Carus's manuscript. He's a Latin poet, an Epicurean on the nature of things, De Rerum Natura. Okay, and it ended up in the Vatican Library because somebody, some heretic in, in the Vatican preserved it. Okay, and of course, it, that manuscript was secretly circulating in the Renaissance times, all right, led to the, to the, to the heresies, of course, of Giordano Bruno, helped encourage his heresies, who was actually one of the first people who who recognized the relativity of motion long before Einstein and Lorentz and, and David Hilbert and everybody else who, who made Einstein, who he didn't give credit to, um, long or gave partial credit late to. And all of that way back to there. And, and a Puritan woman, the first English translation of this, Lucy Hutchinson, okay, she translated this. And what, what is a Puritan? repressed in a repressed religion, translating this atheistic work uh, doing in the 1600s. Interesting stuff. Okay, now 
What, what about the gods? All of us have ideas of it. Most of them are patriarchal for us in our time, you know. Watch it, because watch God, God, God is watching you, and so, so forth. Of course, I had to include Monty Python's picture of God up there with Karl Marx's face. All right. Okay. How did the gods show up? Okay. Well, if you go back to the Makapahanskit cave, we have our first clues from three million years ago at the time of Australopithecus africanus. All right, there is a manuport, which means a, a stone carried long distances by, 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 by bipedal ancestors of, of our own genus, the genus Homo. Of course, there have been many species of Homo sapiens, uh, many gene species of, of, ho of the genus Homo were the only surviving species. Okay, and this small, it's about this big, just enough to, it fits into someone's hand. It has been worn and carried, and it resembles a face. Okay, it, it, it was of value to somebody. It was carried several miles from its, from its outcropping source and was in this, and it has no particular use other than it meant something to the carrier, okay? Because it resembled the face of an australopithecine, okay? Well, 260,000, 280,000 years ago, figure, a Venus figurines began to appear, and over tens of thousands of years, you had these Venus figurines, okay? Remember, Homo sapiens are, we, we have agency detecting mechanisms in our brain, as Scott Atron in his massive anthropological study has shown, um, pulling together lots and lots of, of sources. We, part of what makes us survive is we can, we detect agencies, minds, others looking at us. It kept us safe because of the tiger that might be stalking us or things like that. And because of what we didn't understand, we peopled the world with beings like ourselves, with intentions. And of course, this process goes down through the ages, lots of Venus figurines. Yep, down through the ages, tens of thousands of years, brings us down to about 12,000 years ago, okay? Now, about 15,000 years ago, a very unusual figure appears, which has been later called the master of the beasts, Reza Aslan, our, at our own UCR here, in his, in his History of God, uh, discussed this. Of course, this has been discussed since, since the 19th century. Le Trois Frères is a cave in, in France from about 15,000 years ago. And there's a whole bunch of living creatures from the late Pleistocene emerging from a composite figure like that. One that is kind of ambiguous sexually, but quite resembles a male, actually, in many ways, but still ambiguous. Okay, and it's been called, it was called the sorcerer at one time, but it's not, it's, it's actually a deity, most likely. And the motif of the master of the beasts appears for the next few thousand, next few thousand years, centuries coming down. It appears, for instance, in the Gabel el, el Arak knife from about 5,500 years to 5,200 years ago, right there, a master of the beasts, about 4,300 years ago from, from Mesopotamia here. And you begin to, and of course, the same from 800, since it's famous for us from from the inscription of Yahweh and his Asherah. That's Yahweh, Yahweh's a late, a late, late arrival on the scene. Okay, and all of the Abrahamic religions that came from that. Still you have the master of the beast motif there. And I could have showed you multiple pictures of, of this. What happens is though that in the period after the master of the beasts, for sure documented, okay, begins to appear in our religions, which is quite patriarchal, actually. You begin to have what I have called ear, escalating asymmetrical reciprocity. Remember, we're, we're social animals. We like to make deals, right? It's the basis of our morality. If you're trying to make deals with invisible powers, 
it gets escalated, right? Because no, you're trying to catch the ear of some, somebody, it's not coming down. So human sacrifice came along. Here is, and this is present in every continent, just about except for Antarctica, okay? Uh, this, is from, this is from Oxfordshire, England, a couple thousand years ago, a victim of human sacrifice. It's present on every continent. It's a resulting of escalating asymmetrical reciprocity. And of course, established religions rose from all that. Religion comes from the Latin word religio, which means the making of the rules. It's not the same as spirituality that, that we mean today. So from that, we get all of our personifications from these ancient traditions, whether it's the, it's the matriarchal deities or the patriarchal deities going away, not quite back in, in time as far, the, the mother earth, you know, mother earth, father sky, the great spirit, so forth, various matriarchal deities, the goddess of the tides, you know, the, the goddess of the moon. Of course, it still influences our traditions today. Mary, the mother of God, right? Etc. Okay. The gods of the elements of nature, like vol volcanic deities, very important. Okay. You know, we've had a volcanic deity that, that um, likely was the cause of, of the Abrahamic traditions too, another volcanic deity. And of course, we have multiplied all kinds of gods. And it is in this setting, in ancient Greece, okay, about 2,500 years ago, a little bit more than that, 20, 20, 2,600 years ago, Greece, of course, was, ancient Greece was not a unified place, much of city-states, trade, commerce, fishing, agriculture, so forth, and a well-developed mythology with gods on Mount, Mount Olympus, right? It was in this world that the first steps to demystifying the world took place, where natural causation began to be looked at, and that is the Ionian dawn, as Arthur Kessler has called it. Natural causation began to, and there are many of them, we don't have time to discuss them. Many, uh, they prevailed, they began to think outside of the mythical worldviews. Thales, Anaximander, the infinite universe, Pythagoras, of course, who hid the existence of irrational numbers because he only wanted to hold sacred the rational numbers, those which can be whole number fractions. Uh, Epicurus, Democritus, of course, Adams in the void, and Aristarchus, you know, the heliocentric model, 17 centuries before Copernicus ever thought about it, existed. Of course, Democritus, I want to concentrate on one strand of this. Democritus of Abdera, the, the laughing philosopher, he was the one that said the world is made of indivisible world particles, atomos, where we get the word atom, which means it can't be cut any further. Of course, we know it's changed a little bit. In motion, in the void. And he postulated many worlds arose around many stars and many moons. Uh, creatures out there, perception, thinking, and feeling are all attributes of matter, he said. And long before optics, he saw through the eye of reason far into infinity. Thomas Wright from the Enlightenment 1750 wrote that. Without any James Webb Space Telescope or anything like that, he looked in beyond all of that. Of course, Aristarchus of Samos, uh, heliocentric theory long before Copernicus. Archimedes of Syracuse, who actually was the real first discoverer of the calculus in a certain sense. Okay, as we know from his palimpsest, which was a manuscript which had been scrubbed so they could write prayers and songs on it in Eastern Orthodoxy, but underneath by infrared light, they were able to show that it was Archimedes' writings with the use of zero and infinity and calculation of limits and integral calculus and so forth there. I want to come to Epicurus now. He was the one that first posed the question of theodicy, the tetralemma. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? 
is he neither able nor willing? Why call him God? That was Epicurus. And he also talked about why should I fear death? Uh, if I am, then death is not. If death is, then I am not. Okay. He wrote over 300 books, all lost to history. Okay. Part of the col collapse of civilization that brought down the, Ale the Alexandrian library that, that destroyed when the, that uh, was only began to be recovered in the Renaissance. And of course, because of that surviving poem on the nature of things, Lu Lucretius's. Now, let's summarize what he saw all without a telescope and how he said, nature of the universe has inherent lawfulness, seamless causality, it's self-generating and spontaneous, causally explicable, intrinsically intelligible and coherent, nature explains herself as it were, the totality of actions of one infinite self-moving substance, monism, okay? And we won't get hung up on causality. It's a touchy subject now with quantum mechanics and everything. But in general terms, the regularities are causal. Okay, so, and it can be summarized. Nature of the universe is eternal because nothing comes from, into being from nothing and nothing vanishes into nothing. Even Alex Valenkin, uh, when he says tunneling from nothing, it's not really from nothing. So two, it's infinite in extent. Nothing is outside, beyond, or external to it. It is centerless and boundless, everywhere and always emergent from one substance via universal cause causation. In it, we are not alone, all other beings, great or small, in numberless worlds, in infinite space-time, and whatever we perceive, think on, or our imaginations conceive of are all products, are all self-products of nature or the universe. Unity. This is, this is ultimately where our Unitarianism can come from. Now, let's apply this in our situation. Religion is regarded by the common people as true. This is what Seneca said. He was a Stoic philosopher, a Roman. By the wise as false and by the rulers as useful. And of course, this is Virgil cited by, by Anthony Collins in the Enlightenment. This is his beautiful translation. He said, happy is the man, says the divine Virgil, who has discovered the causes of things and is thereby cured of all kinds of fear, fears, even of death itself and all the noise and din of hell. And this is Spinoza in the ethics, in the appendix of his ethics. He said, hence anyone who seeks for the true causes of miracles and strives to understand natural phenomena as an intelligent being and not gaze on them like a fool is set down and denounced as, as an impious heretic by those whom, whom the masses adore as the interpreters of nature and the gods. Such persons know that with the removal of ignorance, the, the wonder which forms the only available means for proving and preserving their authority would vanish also. Jean Meslier, of course, the Curé d'Etre Pigny in the Ardennes. He was a priest, 1694 to 1729. He secretly, as he was a priest, wrote a huge manuscript he called his Testament, where he basically said, I never believed any of this re religious nonsense, and, um, and, there, and there is no God after life, et cetera. And, and the church helps tyrants like Louis XIV to keep all of you pure, poor and exploited. You're on your own, but stand up to the bastards and you just might create a fairer world. That's paraphrased there. He was the one that said, man will not be free until the last king is, is choked on the entrails of the last priest. Okay, so you have to have that kind of language, you have to realize the oppression under which people were emerging there. But from, from uh, Baron Dolbach, Paul Henri Thierry, he says, from the system of the nature, système de la nature, 1770. He said, if we go back to the beginning, we shall find that ignorance and fear created the gods, that fancy, enthusiasm, by enthusiasm that he meant fanaticism, or deceit adorned them, that weakness worships them and credulity preserves them, and that custom respects and tyranny supports them in order to make the blindness of men serve their own interests. 
If the ignorance of nature gave birth to the gods, the knowledge of nature is calculated to destroy them. If, if only by dis, it is only by the dispelling of the clouds and phantoms of religion, he's speaking of organized religion there, that we shall discover truth, reason, and morality. Of course, this is the type of daring that was thought um, under much worse conditions than we have today then. George uh, Santayana of the last century said, my atheism like that of Spinoza is true piety toward the universe and denies only gods fashioned by men in their own image to be servants of their human interests. Okay. And of course, the idea has always been there. Frank Lloyd writes that I believe in God, only I spell it nature and so forth. All right. Well, this is what Richard Dawkins said in a debate with Francis Collins. He said, if there is a God, it's going to be a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more incomprehensible than anything that any theologian of any religion has ever proposed. Time Magazine, 2006. And of course, all of these are ultimately the issues of, of the heart, as William Faulkner called it, the issues of the human heart in conflict with itself. Okay. And at this point, I would like to close with this benediction from Alexander Pope. All are but parts of one stupendous whole. I, by, by the way, just let me say a word about Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope is somebody who has been liked by everybody, but he was actually a subversive as well. So when he said that he, he was actually engaging in most uh, English uh, professors don't realize this, I, I'm afraid. Okay, all right. When he was saying things like, let, let Newton, God said, you know, every, everything was in darkness, but let Newton be and all was light. Okay, he was in fact engaging in satire and irony. Okay, and so he spoke in terms that everybody loved, but he was actually getting a subversive message. And here it is right here. All are but parts of one stupendous whole whose body nature is, and God the soul, that changeth through all and yet in all the same, great in the earth as in the ethereal frame, warms in the breeze, warms in the sun, refreshes in the breeze, glows in the stars and blossoms in the trees, lives through all life, extends through all extent, spreads undivided, operates unspent, breathes in our soul and forms our mortal part as full as perfect in a hair as heart. And then he advises, slave to no sect who takes no private road, but looks through, through nature up to nature's God. And um, it is that foundation which we need to remember our heritage, not get caught up in the tribalism of the left and the right today with identity politics, and theocrat, theocracy and corporatism and all of, of that. We need a universal ethics and a universal view, and it's based on a cos cosmology ultimately that will not accept answers from authority. Th thank you very much. So I need to put the other slide back on, or are you going to take it from there? Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Lee. When I was a boy each week I'd 
Sunday we would go to church and pay attention to the priest. He would read the holy word and consecrate the holy bread. And everyone would kneel and bow. Today the only difference is everything is holy now. Everything, everything. Everything is holy now. And when I was in Sunday school, we would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two. Jesus made the water wine. And I remember feeling sad. Miracles don't happen still But now I can't keep track Cause everything's a miracle Everything, everything, everything's a miracle Wine from water is not so small Better magic trick is that anything is here at all. So the challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles, to finding where there isn't one. When holy water was rare at best, it barely wet my fingertips. Now I have to hold my breath Like I'm swimming in a sea of air It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rain hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Cause everything is holy now Singing like a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out How things have changed since then Everything is holy now It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Everything is whole now. Thank you so much, Lee, for sharing your valuable time and your insights with us this morning. 
We sincerely appreciate you and look forward to seeing you again. We'll now have a 10 to 15 minute uh, discussion and uh, Lee will be here also to answer any questions uh, you have. Uh, this is immediately following our service uh, for us to share our thoughts on today's topic. Uh, please be aware that this is included on the video that is posted. I will leave up our contact information for just a moment and then we'll have uh, our Q&A uh, with Lee. Yes, comments, questions, discussion. The microphone's right here and it's on if anybody, and of course, if people are on Zoom, we'll also acknowledge you too if you have questions or comments. Yes, we have, we have a comment there and then Thank you. Yes, that's right. Thank, thank you so much for your tribute to, to your husband. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your beautiful tribute to your husband as well. Thank you. Yes. Bill. Okay. Being the master of awkward questions that I am, okay, not master, but just disciple. There is this. A friend of mine who is in the Marine Corps uh, at one point had to say, in terms of religion, you know, all of you are coming from different places. For the purposes of the United States Marine Corps, there is no God on the parade ground. In other words, where you practice, when you practice in how to strip your weapons, storm a hill, not to be stormed by other people's uh, 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 weaponry and ill intent. God, it's lovely to, to talk about God, but uh, when it comes to solving the problems, uh, he's not there. Now, what do you work with? So the problem now being, you have some people in the Unitarian field who, you know, I'm a pagan. Many of the stuff that's here was beautiful to me because it's old images. Correct. Many more of it was beautiful because I could look at a nature that didn't, you know, you, you, you live with the idea that every so often God's going to try to kill you. So far, I've not taken meth, gotten into a fight in a biker bar, or gone uh, uh, bungee diving with a, a slipknot. So I'm feeling pretty good about this week, uh, just as, as we start off. Right. But you're going to run into people who are religious, and their hearts moved deeply, like with everything yes. is holy back. Yes. How do you keep your allies? Correct. Well, I mean, let's take, uh, let's take an example, Mr. John Locke, okay? <laughs> he spoke the language often of Christians, even though, he, even, though him, even though he was a radical underneath. Similarly, with a number of the others, Alexander Pope would, would be another example, things like that. Basically, it's, it's important to be willing to listen to everybody where they are, to listen across the tribes, you know, don't be stuck with, oh, I only talk to Democrats or I only talk to, you know, I won't talk to Trump voters or whatever. All that tribalism we have to, with our human empathy, our 
the following the diamond rule, the, the golden rule, and then the diamond rule, ex go beyond outside of our own comfort zone to keep dialogue going with others to inc inspire them with the values that inspire us. Yep. Yep. Any other questions on any questions online? Comments online? Is somebody online trying to say something there? Tinka. Uh, okay. Yes, we have Tinka online, and then and then you. Yes, correct. Um, Lee, I just wanted to thank you very much for the service, the sermon. Um, forget the pun, but it was very enlightening. Um, so, um, and and obviously a great deal of research. I mean, a, um, a great deal. Just that, a great deal of research went into it. I thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to point out, um, since we're talking about Unitarian, you know, our heritage and things, I just wanted to point out when you mentioned uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, the letter that he wrote to uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, I just wanted to mention, if there were people that didn't know that, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who also was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, was... Um, it's embraced by both Unitarian and Universalists. Um, he attended both, uh, he went to, to both churches. And in fact, he, um, he believed uh, in the universality of salvation, universal salvation, which is why the Universalists really um, followed, you know, embraced him. Um, and also he uh, helped Richard Allen to found the African-American Episcopal Church, AME Church. Wow. Uh, so um, I, I, I really, um, I really enjoy that man and, and what, uh, what he stood for, what he did and everything. So I just wanted to, to say that. Oh, yes. Thank you for bringing up the letter that I read from was a letter that Jefferson wrote to Benjamin Rush. Yeah, that is Dr. 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 Benjamin Rush, who was, as you stated, did all the things that you stated, including being a signer of the declaration. Yeah. Thank you, Tinka. Yes. I just, I just want to ask for the name of the person who you showed uh, during his, what, perhaps uh, 30 years of giving sermons, I guess. At night in his diary, he would write that he didn't believe any of this nonsense and it was all BS. Well, who was that person again? <laughs> oh, <it's> yes. Hysterical. <laughs> yes, yes, that was, uh, that, that was Jean Meslier. Jean J E A N Meslier M E S L I E R. Not only he he served a poor parish, he sought to do to help them in every way that he could, but he was actually a revolutionary underneath, and he was so uh, he was so radical that even Voltaire, when he translated him, tried to domesticate him into a moderate deist. So. <laughs> Even Voltaire tried to domesticate him. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you. Yes. I guess it's a follow-up question. Yes. How do you keep your allies? Well, for example, how do we make our uh, the path of the Enlightenment look like something that a Republican who is wanting to at least keep the trappings of democracy, but is actually more interested in power at this moment, the gathering and holding of power. You know, how would you build that bridge? Well, it's always important to distinguish between common people and elites, right? Okay, so our fellow Republican voters, you know, our fellow Democratic voters, and those of us who voted for third party, you know, so forth. Um, it's important, it's important for us to find common ground in every case. So when you're talking to a Republican, they regard your standard everyday libertarian Republican, they regard the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as almost sacred. Okay? So you can, 
you have, so we can say, well, you know, we both value and respect that. You can begin to introduce some of the, some of the openness and the radicalness of those documents, then they'll see that they were, that they were documents that cannot be, that cannot con condone theocratic uh, pretensions or any of the stuff that Baron Dolbach talked about, you know, or Spinoza in his ethics, you know, the types of abuse of power. Yes, correct. So I, again, by being good people, following the diamond rule, treating others as they would like to be treated, you know, that's the best way that we, that we have to, in, to, to make friends and then to engage conversations, of course. So we should always be friends outside of our tribes. If we're only talking to people that we agree with, we're not actually carrying on dialogue. Yep, correct. Yes, other comments, questions? Sarcastic remarks, yeah. Do I have a book? I, yeah, yes, I have, but not one that would be a pleasure to read, so. So, <laughs> written, written, written a couple of them, but, uh, but yes, I've got a major website which has been up before, which is getting ready to be reposted again in enlightenmentlegacy.net. And then, and then there's the, then the, then the, then the bigger part of it is enlightenmentlegacy.net forward slash cosmos, which is, uh, that's no, no problem. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I occasionally do, you know, there is an article, there is a paper that I did with Philip Clayton at, uh, uh, which is on the issue of theodicy which is written for a more general audience. So you'd probably enjoy that if you want to read that. Yeah. Most of my technical stuff is on evolutionary biology so. <laughs> and things like that. So, yeah. All right, go ahead. You mentioned a sarcastic remark. Um, yes. President Biden going in, how should I put, put it politely, but uh, cozying up to uh, MBS I do have a little trouble with the application of diamond rule in that case. I understand. Well, the diamond rule, of course, it's rest. Remember, the evolutionary algorithm is 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 uh, cooperate on the first move, then reciprocate on the other moves. Okay, that means we have to have a defense. Okay, um, that's that that is why self defense is moral. Okay. You don't let your family be walked over. We have to stand up. Sometimes you have to stand up against. And remember, as uh, Malcolm X said it, said it. Um, there comes a time when he was critiquing the the main civil rights movement. He said, he said, you all do too much singing. It's time to stop singing and start swinging. He said, there wasn't anything pacifistic about Thomas Jefferson, right? Really. Okay, and so, so sometimes the peoples of the world have to defend themselves from elites, parasitic elites, as such as John, Jean Meslier may, may have talked about them in his time or written about them at nighttime after he went home to his, to the parish, right? Okay, and you know, remember, our forebears in Unitarian Universalism were people that felt there was something worth dying for, right? They wouldn't bow down to some of the idols that were put up in front of them, right? We have to have that same toughness too. And also don't get into it over little stuff. Don't argue with people over, pick your battles, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Triggers another, An another triggered question. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we're this, you know, but with what's happened lately in the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the sudden rise of Trump and so, uh, uh, so on, the situation that we've had, yes, shell shock and numbness and pain. Yep. Uh, what are, do we go back to the 1960s and uh, what are some, ideas from the 60s 
that you would that you would like to see uh, repeated now? What are some of the ones that are repeating that you don't see now? And in other words, how do you build the good, avoid the bad, and how would you number those? Right. So first of all, let's remember that bad Supreme Court decisions have come down before, you know, and throughout history, governments have done all kinds of nasty things, you know, like like the Edict of Nantes was was was, was revoked by the King of France, and there was a massacre of Huguenots, right? You know, so bad stuff can happen. In our own country, the Dred Scott case was also a Supreme Court case, right? Said that everyone was bound to hand over slaves to whoever demanded, claimed that they were the owners of slaves, of human beings, right? Okay, so this all of it passes. You know, as James Branch Cabell said, kings and presidents and whatever, um, pass like, mul like mulberries in season, and then they're gone, okay? You know, it's dust. We don't have to forsake our values just because somebody does some craziness somewhere, right? There's, there was underground railroads at one time, you know, to help escape slaves. There was armed resistance by the slaves and by the former slaves, self-liberating slaves, you know, which too often forgot, forgotten, you know, that, that, that slavery generally ends because slaves throw it off, right? You know, and, and so forth through multiple rebellions and forcing wars and all of that. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is people who are rescuing people you know, for instance, uh, fr from Nazi Germany, the, the victims of the Holocaust, you know, which include Jews, gypsies, Slavs, many others, they were rescued by people. That light that, uh, that, is, recommend, uh, that is represented by our chalice was, what, what, what was part of the resistance to that. Are there young women and girls that we need to help and protect now? Just, just because some you know, as Christopher Hitchens called them, hysterical old people in a Supreme Court made a decision somewhere, you know. Yeah, yeah. Resistance is, free thinkers have to resist, right? Because you're going against the stream. You can't wait things just to take you along. Otherwise you'll join, you'll be an accomplice, right? Rather, rather than doing what's, what's morally right, yeah. That, uh, that is correct. We have to act ourselves, correct. Correct. That is correct. Yep, and we have to act in love, not out of hatred. Otherwise, it's gonna backfire. If we act out of hatred, it's going to backfire. That's right, love is, has to be centered on it. Yes, we're running out of time. So one more question, please. One more question. One more question, comment, or ironic or sarcastic remark. You can, you're welcome to those too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> I don't think I have this in my words. Ah, our closing, yes, yes. Uh, we have a closing hymn, which is a, uh, it's not in our hymnal, we will sit back and listen to Holy Now by Peter Mayer. Thank you. <laughs>